Watt from Pedro Show, January 25th, 2009 edition. This started off show with John Coltrane playing Offering, which actually came out after. It was done in the last year of his life. And then we heard Feedbacker Part 3 by Bars, and Brother Matt... Yeah. Thanks for well, uh, having us aboard yeah. here at the Love Grotto. Welcome, welcome back. My pleasure point. We have some guests that yeah. drove down to Pedro. Oh, cool. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> welcome. John Fushani. Josh. Klinghoffer. Klinghoffer. <laughs> welcome aboard. You've been to Pedro a lot. Well, you came and did a video last year. Yeah. yeah. Over here right at Silicon right City, right? We drove past that on the way here. Yeah. Yeah, Gus Van Sant. That's right over here. Yeah. Yeah, if you come back, you got to hide out here if you need it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, welcome aboard. Um, you made a record. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Josh. Uh, yeah, you both did. Yeah. Yeah. He okay. was uh, on tour with you. Yeah, he was playing rhythm guitar and... Uh, keyboards and some percussion uh, for the last like six months of the last Chili Peppers tour yeah um, we've we've probably made like what, like seven or eight solo records of my solo records we've done together and um, you yeah. want them all Josh? yeah most of them yeah. most of the last from the yeah second. last batch mm-hmm. yeah and there's a couple of that then when he was like on tour with somebody else or something or but um, like there was one I did in DC that was where I just went there by myself and did that thing with Ian. But um, but yeah, uh, but yeah, we've we've known each other for like eleven years, and I don't know the album we just made. It's kind of kind of uh, yeah, it's sort of just the furthest step and all that we everything we've been like reaching for and uh, taking it upon ourselves to just. Uh, you know, to be to be doing whatever we want in studios, just gradually, you know, understanding, mixing and recording, and yeah, yeah, you know, real, figuring out ourselves how to get the sounds we're hearing in our what head. What studio did you use? My home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a few studio setups in my house, and for this album, we used the big one. It was like a big forty-eight track, uh, two, you know, two twenty-four track tape machines and big forty channel. API console and that used to be at the record plant in New York in the 70s and yeah, it's, it's you know in the cool old 70s style studio yeah mm-hmm. what do you what do you call this record the Empyrean the Empyrean yeah yeah <clears throat> um yeah it's symbolic on a lot of levels of the the story which is kind of an uh just that uh has a lot to do with uh, 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 sort of a, about inner about inner life uh, the the kind of trials you go through in, inside yourself that really don't ever get even talked about into the outside world or expressed in any way other than in your connection to creativity you know and and uh, all the ups and downs that come with that and that so, so that was the subject matter, and then music was also reflecting the same dynamics of the story. And I just feel like, as a record, it was kind of like a just a just a peak for for us in terms of really being able to have what's coming out of the speakers be what we're hearing in our heads. Because for a long time, we had to translate to, through other people. So, yeah. I also see it as being kind of a peak that me and him have been like working towards for a long time. Flea plays bass on it, and. Uh, Johnny Marr played guitar in a couple of songs. When was it done? It was finished like a year ago. Whoa. Yeah. Um, you finished a year ago? Almost. Not in, you know, I guess we finished it in like April. Yeah. We yeah. started it in the end of 2007. Yeah. No, the end of 2006, I think. Very end of. Two, the end of 2006? No. Christmas, like right around Christmas. Yeah, it was done over the course of like a year. Is that, is but the that end right? of 2006 is when I was yes. uh, playing with you yeah, in that's, Europe. Yeah, that's six, right. Because then I was touring. Yeah, yeah. Remember? 
miss him. Man. Yeah, so it was December of 2006, and I yeah. mostly recorded throughout on and off. But you know, there's probably o- <laughs> it was probably only a, a total of about two and a half months at the most of actual recording and mixing time. But yeah, there yeah, was yeah. just huge gaps in between because right. we were on tour, and when I got home, I was making other kinds of music all the time, and and didn't want to just do one thing all the time. So yeah, it's probably only we still we record really quickly. It's probably it was it probably only. You know, and we this is the most we've ever taken our time making a record, and still it probably only totaled two, two and a half months of actual days. Like, what, demo? Or just go for it? No, we had it pretty clear in my in our heads, because I, I usually, I our process usually starts where, like, I'll write a song, and I'll make a, record a, uh, a version of all the songs that I'm thinking that we're going to have on a particular album just on guitar yeah just guitar and yeah. singing th- into onto a mini like disc a sketch outline yeah i mean i usually have the the basic arrangement real clear in my head so so i'll just record like the whole album is just guitar and singing into my mini disc and then i'll give josh a cd of it and then he just drives around in his car like listening to it and making up drum parts in his head yeah. and stuff and then we get together you know a few times and 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 refine the you know drum parts but but like he he pretty much usually has it all mapped out in his head we we think of music real similarly so it doesn't seem like i ever really play with like i don't know it seems like like with him playing drums and flea playing bass it was just like not really you ain't ain't got teaching yeah (laughs) yeah they they know where i'm coming from you know so 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 we we just uh you know, maybe an accent here or there, that, but but basically, I like I like to be surprised by what they come up with and stuff. So yeah, it's so yeah, big. so we just do that, and then we 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 just uh, record them from there. We used we once made demos, and we didn't really like that. Like it, like it, we ended up kind of in the studio just trying to copy the demo. And we still <laughs> often like the demo a lot. Yeah, and we like the, like demo, the demo more. Demo so so it, it's better to 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 enjoy that process of creativity in the studio rather than thinking of it as like you're trying to copy something which is just like measuring something or something it's not uh, it's not fun you know so with this album there was a lot of like experimentation and uh the main bass the main basic guitar drums bass were done in three days i think yeah yeah the basic tracks were done super quick and and any other songs we added after that like the first song was done in like two days yeah Experiment. I want to hear it. Can we hear the sound? Yeah. Okay. Well, from Pedro Show, we just heard something off uh, John Frusciante's new f- solo record, The Empyrean, mm. uh, a tune called Dark Light. Uh, you want to tell us something about that? Uh, yeah, it, was, it, it used to just be the first half of the song, and then... Uh, and then just uh, at a certain point pretty late in the record decided to uh to have the song carry on and and have a completely different feel for the second half so the first half sort of lyrically and musically uh is a is a sort of is sort of symbolic of uh inner darkness and the second half is uh, symbolic of uh inner light yeah. Ah, hence the title. Yeah. Dark Light. And it sounds that way too, like the first half has kind of a dark sound to it and the second yeah. half is really bright sounding and Yeah, um yeah, this second half is one of the few things that I play all the instruments on on the record, uh, where I play bass and I play drum machine and stuff, but like usually it's Flea playing bass and Josh playing drums. Right, right. Um yeah, I'm experimenting a lot with you know, tripped out. Yeah, the tune done, and like, I want to add more to it. Uh, yeah, it was the first half was the whole song, and then just one day it popped into my head a way to to continue it on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Trip. And before that, we heard uh, "My Coup by <laughs> New York Kutanchi. I think it's a father and son. Wow. This guy's playing bass. He's like in his mid forties. And he's got his boy playing with him half his age. Kind of trippy concept. Yeah. Father and son. I saw Amit Ali and Rashid Ali like that. Mm-hmm. Rashid played with the train. Yeah. And a mean bass player. In fact, at first he was with uh, James Bud Omer. Mm-hmm. Wild guitars. Yeah. 
And the drummer was a young guy. This is the early 80s. Many men got to play with Blood Elmer. And uh, the drummer is this guy named Calvin Weston, Philadelphia guy. And last year he came out from Philly and played some gigs with him, you know, <laughs> 25 years later. And uh, he told me, I mean, at least stop bass. Put it away. Mm. He doesn't play it anymore. That was monster bass player. Yeah. Like a freight train coming out of his chest. I remember meeting Rashid, and he, uh, his hat was a turtle shell. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Trippy drummer. Beautiful. All right. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Before that, we had a, a band called People with Eyeball Balls reporting faster, and then we started that chunk of music. Oh, somebody's leash is gone. With another song from John Frusciani's solo album, Empyrean, Before the Beginning, which is the first track. Yeah. yeah. Any thoughts? Want to say something about the first song? Um, <laughs> it's kind of our maggot brain. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, it's, it, it, it was inspired uh, by that idea of having, having the, an album have a slow have a slow start that kind of uh, invites you into a space uh, rather than pushing itself out at you, but... It's not in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, it's not in a hurry to get anything started and and uh, and just doing all kinds of tripped out, you know, you know, tripped out backwards uh, effects of different types uh, and, and, and uh, playing the mixing board like an instrument, you know. Yeah, yeah. That was like, another one that was yeah. done a lot of later. Yeah, it was one of the last things we did, and it was done really quickly, and, and uh, you know, it, it was it was just kind of trying to round out the record. I, the album already had this song after the ending that seemed like a real specific type of ending, so I figured I wanted to have a specific type of beginning, and... and uh, and I just thought there's not enough records that start out slowly like that. Like Maggot Brain does, people often just try to put their, you know, big uh, people pleaser out front, you know. And so, so, so we figured that we'd start kind of in the murky depths of darkness and yeah, and and uh, and rise up out of there and and uh, yeah. And I just for the whole album, we were really into just uh, trying to do new things with old styles of uh, recording that. Uh, in terms of doing all tape edits and uh, no automation on the board, but like me and Josh and the engineer Adam would all just be there with our hands on the board, we don't moves and, like that. and stuff. Yeah, so like we, it was, it was, it was just like um, you know, sort of, sort of trying to do new things with these old techniques that, in a lot of ways, have been discarded. Uh, Sorry. Typically, you know, in the computer world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you ever hear about it? The Maggot Brain. Uh, yeah, George. George Clinton actually came to my house and I played it for him. The the uh, that before the beginning and another song that that, that has a, sort of an early funkadelic uh, influence. There's nothing funk about the record, but mixing wise, I'm real influenced by the sound of their first three records and that 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 sort of haphazard style of uh, mixing. So yeah, George Clinton's kind of like he told me about like. Him what he was Hazel. doing, yeah, when, when they were doing that track. Saying, like, your mother died. You <laughs> should play like your mother died, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you ever hear the original version of that? It's like. With the whole band. Yeah, it's a whole band. It was and, done in the mix with mute buttons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just mixed it. Like, yeah, I guess he made, like, the people in the. You know, like, the bass player was like. You took away the groove of the song, you know. But it's to me, it is Billy Bass's groove and the drummer's groove. You know, it's it's like it's like a. It, it, it was that way a lot on our record because we we do basic tracks with me playing rhythm guitar and some songs like that didn't have drums. The basic track that every we didn't use a click. It would be like play to the groove of my guitar, guitar but we didn't use my rhythm guitar on most things. You know. Um, yeah, we replaced it with the stuff that had a lot less time you know like a temporal structure yeah Keyboard. but it's still that's the groove that's running through everything i, I like the, those kind of invisible connectors a lot of people use a click track that way but yeah, when yeah. it's an actual human groove 
it really creates yeah, yeah. an unusual uh, link between all the Fred. old dubs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're saying you know, all this uh, experiment in the real time. You know, your first solo record. You mm. ever think about that when you do these things? Yeah, yeah. That was really good. Man, that record is wild. Thanks, yeah. I, I did a four-track thing when I was making this record that sounds exactly like it would have been on my first record. It, my head is at a pretty similar place. In a lot of ways, I feel like... like uh, what I did on this record is very similar in a lot of ways to what I would have wanted to do then if I would have known how to use a studio because it's a pretty psychedelic album and that was where my head was at at that time and there's a lot of what I was listening to and I just tried to be that trippy on a four track, you know, with, with just like guitar and voice and backwards, you know, yeah, flipping yeah. the tape over and stuff like that, but... um. But yeah, I feel I feel like uh, in a lot of ways I was trying to produce those same kind of uh, effects on the psyche of the listener uh, with this is what I was doing then. I mean, it, and also like my my state of mind when I made that stuff on my first record, I wasn't imagining people ever hearing it. And even though when we started making this record, I was thinking of it like a record. Eventually, it just became something to to play late at night in my living room to trip my head out and to try to mix in such a way that I would have fun listening to it over yeah. and over because I'm just going, whoa, you know, like, like, and play it when my friends come over and stuff just to, yeah, just to trip people's heads out. Like, it's not, I, I stopped, I, I'm sort of good at tricking myself that way, I guess. I, I started, I stopped really even thinking about that it was something that was going to be released. And yeah, we kind of we didn't hurry at all. That's why. It's a yeah, we weren't in any kind of a hurry. We just it, it it so it really ended up being done in that same kind of spirit as my first record, where I was making it and thinking this is just for me and my friends. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Not Mersh. <laughs> no. Yeah, I love that record, man. That is wild. It made me think a little bit of Sid Barrett, a little bit yeah. of time. Was yeah, I was you. really into Sid Barrett at that time. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah that Piper. But, Piper then, the, but then the other two, the Madcap and, yeah, and Barrett. Yeah, and Barrett, yeah. For trippy records. Yeah, they kind of, re, like, because the whole time I was playing guitar as a teenager, I really wasn't into acoustic guitar. I kind of, it was forced on me when I started playing. I had to play acoustic guitar because my parents went by me an electric and I had to prove myself on acoustic. You yeah, know? yeah. And so, so, uh, I, I think I, I didn't I didn't do anything with acoustic guitar for like the first nine years that I was playing guitar but when I was 21 and I, I uh, I'd had those Sid Barrett albums for a while but I got obsessed with them when I was I'd had them since I was like 15 but I got obsessed with them when I was like 21 and it it uh, it made me become really into writing songs on acoustic guitar and recording it just made me see acoustic guitar uh you know, as something that it's a privilege to play instead of as something that you have to play. <laughs> like the, bur mm. the burden. Oh, wow. So, when you were coming up with the songs to show the Josh, Flea, and those guys, j jamming them out, or in your mind, you had. Um, like the uh, rhythm guitar is going to be a tool to show them, but I have an idea. Uh, you know, I write the music and the lyrics. Yeah, yeah. You know, chords and 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 lyrics and and melody all at once. It's it's all it's always been one process with me. So so. Uh, but you ever think like I'll show the guys with the guitar and we'll have that guide track? Then I'll lose it. That, that was the idea because I was really. I, I was really at that time I was really enjoying uh, records uh, like the first couple of Roxy Music records and, yeah. the, and the Doors in the 60s where the guitar unlike in most rock music it's not playing a prominent role it's more playing like embellishments on yeah, top yeah. and it's more Josh got really good on the organ and electric pianos and stuff like that uh, in the last few years he, he, he was uh, playing that in, in a couple of bands that he was on tour with where he, he just it, I I just was really liking the I I'd never really used those instruments much on my solo records and then it started to just seem like a good idea to make music that was more uh, where the keyboards is, are the more more the thing that's playing the chords and if there's a guitar it's more something on top of it and then that yeah. takes the song away from from its original conception a lot of these songs 
when they started, they sounded like kind of uh, just very, very different than they do now. Like now, the chords are the chords are all kind of difficult to place. Whereas they were, I was kind of I used to be really into making like uh, complicated chord progressions and stuff in my songs, and this was like going back to just like major and minor chords and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. But if I would have used guitar as the main thing, it might have even sounded kind of stock or something like that. But with with the keyboards, you you don't even hear what the original conception of the song was. You just yeah. hear the textures that are that it's being pulled out of, and, and you, all. Huh? You don't often hear the original form of the keyboard either. We would <laughs> right. treat it from there. Yeah, we would do electronic treatments to the keyboard. So every the it it the actual end thing is so it's so far from the original. Uh, from the original well, like Gru. Huh? You like Gru, a process. Yeah, so yeah. We would not be like the same. Thing. Yeah, that's why, that's especially why making demos of the things wouldn't have worked because, because, because we, we really used the studio as the compositional tool and as the arrangement tool. We'd fill up all the tracks with all kinds of ideas and then gradually figure out, okay, because we would edit each section, we would mix each song in sections like and do a tape edit. So it would be like, Okay, for the first section, we're just going to use uh, st strings and bass and the electric piano and the vocal, and then the next section will have drums and no, no, you know, and like, you know, and whatever it is, like, like we'll have the we'll have this guitar melody here, and we'll use these reverb effects. It, each section was mixed like it was its own song, you know, so it would be a different central combination, mix. huh? Should play central mix. Uh, yeah, central's <laughs> the, the, the peak of that, because we really got, we started to realize we could really get away with these crazy edits that, didn't, that, yeah, that yeah, like, yeah. You, you wouldn't think would work, but... That's turned, why when Brother Matt asked you about touring, it'd be a little intense. Yeah, no, because it was, yeah, it's all made of edits. It, it, would, it, would, it would be, be an very different. It would be interesting thing to try and do, but... Yeah, it would be the songs in a different form. There's no way we could reproduce what we did on the record, you know, but but we could do something interesting. But yeah, yeah, it was like, like so, so yeah, we, we, we gradually started to realize that, like, you could get away with really drastic edits as long as there's one element that stays the same, everything else can change, and we didn't figure that out till late and we up till then we were like oh make sure nothing moves out of any of the tracks and then eventually we were like we move everything but one thing you know and and uh, and it worked you know as long yeah, as that yeah. keyboard part doesn't sound like it's changed you believe it when everything else changes place you know so it, so we we would have if we would have made demos we would have had no idea where it was going and we would have probably fallen in love with it in, in some form that we would have felt like we had to we did to. even there was a couple times where we we made rough mixes in say January, and then when we start, we started working again on it in July, and we were going back to those old rough mixes, and we wound up killing ourselves trying to recreate it, and we yeah. would we would move on from that. But happened. It's the end of uh, the first hour, January twenty fifth, two thousand nine. Watt from Pedro show. Hold tight for hour two. We got a jam coming. Watt from Pedro show. Um, start off the second hour with The Sea by Daughters of Fission, Arizona band. And then I'm Gonna Marry You by Connect Nine. And something from Brother Dale, Uno for Dos, what he called a, a tribute. Do one bass for two. And then something new from John Frusciani's solo album, The Empyrean called God. A lot from Pedro Show. Started third out, a third hour off with Elephants by Warpaint. Well, John, that's something you just mixed? Yeah, about a year ago, actually, but it's it's just oh, coming yeah, out just now. Yeah. <laughs> just about a year ago. <laughs> yeah, it was done like exactly right after we were done with the Empyrean. We the Empyrean? I started mixing uh, Warpaint. Yeah, I'm thinking about Empyrean. It means the highest point in heaven. Yeah, yeah. It's in the uh, Divine Comedy. Right. It's one of the... Yeah, really up there. It's where the choir is. It's kind of where uh, Beatrice disappears. She ain't at the very end. She goes and sits near Mary. It's like St. Bernard, I think. <laughs> Ends up taking him to the last... <sighs> gig. Show. Floor show. 
Empyrean, but like empirical. Are they are the words connecting? Maybe uh, like think empirical so. means something. Right, high. Up, you can, yeah, and but, you can measure. Yeah, but in, yeah. Empirical. But Empyrean is specifically. Uh, I think Empyrean was, was yeah, yeah level above because they thought the planets were around us, so it was above the levels of the planets because we yeah. were in the center. Yeah, it's supposed to be the highest point of the highs. Yeah. Yeah, we were. Uh, the idea was we weren't didn't go around the sun. Everything went around us. Right. And Empyrean was way out there. In fact, that's his levels of heavens are different planets. There's different. Yeah, it was a trip. Yeah, that's something, you know, since it's pretty impossible to conceive of space ending at some point, but at the same time, it's 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 all it's just as difficult to imagine it going on endlessly. So I know. I guess the Empyrean is a way of sort of. Uh, you mean express- like infinities? Yeah, you can't. You, you, it's impossible to picture space ending at a point, but it's also impossible to picture it going on forever. And yeah, and, some and the Empyrean is a way of sort of. Come on, stop, Mister Coltrane. <laughs> Of, uh, of conceiving of a highest point that could be or something. Yeah, you know? I mean, some infinities are bigger than others, mm. which is kind of hard to conceive of. Yeah. Like the set of all numbers, right? Yeah. They go on forever. Yeah. They're always yeah. going to be bigger than the set of odd numbers. Right. Right? Yeah, it's always going to be twice as big, but there's Right, no, but it keeps going. There's, there's no twice as big. <laughs> See, I don't know how to work these leashes. So what I do is just hang up on the dude. <laughs> there must be a way to like silence him, right? Without throwing it, crashing against the wall. <coughs> so, but that is trivia. <coughs> but a period, a high point, and like you were saying about the inner light. Yeah, inner- it's about reaching for stuff that's sort of beyond your grasp, but that you keep. Maybe you're charging toward, yeah, yeah, some kind of something inside yourself or something, whatever it is that drives your imagination to keep striving to sort of uh, become one with that, with that energy more and more so in all your actions in your life or, or, um, yeah, to, you know, or like, like people in science or in religion where you're constantly sort of reaching for things that can't completely be understood or attained, but it doesn't stop whatever that forces inside you that drives you to to want to know more and learn more and do more and you know yeah it's about some of the records kind of involve some of the struggles that you go through inside as a creative person just trying to uh trying to become one with something that you don't really understand that doesn't really have any concrete form that you can grasp onto but that you're born with this incentive to to do something and whether it's playing music or yeah. Painting or whatever it is, you know. Yeah, you paint too. I used to, yeah. No more. Not anymore. Oh wow. Yeah, about ten years ago, I decided to limit myself to the things that I felt I had most aptitude for because I'd I'd spent about five years concentrating on things that I didn't have a lot of aptitude for. It was a good learning experience, and it was something good to keep me connected to the artistic force for other reasons besides that I was making a living at it or something. You know, I kind yeah. I kind of stopped doing stopped doing it in the situations where I had any value to the public and started just following my creativity and I think it was a good I think it was a good period of time for me but when I when I sort of came back into the world as it were I I just really wanted to uh focus on writing songs and playing music. guitar and learning about uh you know electronic music from time to time and stuff I got an interview with John Coltrane and he says all musicians are after some kind of truth yeah, you're 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 trying. I feel like we're all expressing things that really can't be expressed any other way. We're expressing truth when something sounds good to our ear, when something connects to our soul. I feel like it's saying something to us, but it's not something that we can put into words. And I think, uh, in some point, in some ways, they can probably be reduced to some kind of mathematical formulas but no musician's conscious of that you just sort of decide I'm going to play this note this hard at this particular exact point in time you know it's all reducible to numbers but we, yeah. we're we driven like the organization of it if something's too many numbers off it's going to be off time and if yeah. it's within a certain margin then it's then it, then we hear it is on time if it's a little late it, it, depending on where you are in the song it's going to be a good groove and it, it can be it can um uh, it can be analyzed that way, but 
we do it purely on intuition and feeling and emotion and and the the setup of our muscles and stuff and we don't really know what we're saying but we know when it means something and it's just an odd yeah it, setup, interactions you know? too between people because yeah. then you got more a lot of times music expresses the you should call them solo albums, but you collaborate. Oh yeah, it's very. It's just because I write the songs, right, right, right. and I'm, you know, like, and so and and producing and stuff. But we we actually made one album that was a collaboration. We could play something off that if maybe. Um, we made one song where it was both of us writing the songs and stuff, and, and well, collaborating with the right. Yeah, yeah. Where some songs were Josh's and some were mine, and and uh, you know, probably if if I wasn't so busy in in the band over the last you know 10 years i we would have done stuff like that more often but um you know it seemed like i was always so anxious to make solo records anytime there was a little break yeah right and so so that's what we would do yeah the need for solo records yeah. i think it's great <laughs> you know yeah you know i've always just spent all my time recording since i was a kid so it's it's kind of more natural for me to do that than it is to do a band. You know, the, a band has been something more that I sort of uh, settled into. It didn't come naturally at first. I'm much more comfortable just working by myself and calling the shots and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, well, I want to talk about how you got to music, but... Oh, yeah, we... Uh, after Elephants... Well, yeah, you didn't tell me how you got involved with that. <laughs> Oh, what? You end up mixing. Uh, They're just friends, and, friends of mine, and and uh, Josh played drums on one song, and I played Mellotron on one song, and they just they had recorded a record, and they needed someone to mix it, and I was so sort of hot on the mixing. You're in mix from, mode. Yeah, from from. <laughs> yeah, my friend Adam started forgetting that that I played guitar, the engineer who was doing it with us, because. <laughs> He was so used to me being the guy on the mixing board and stuff. Right, right, like right. I'd, I'd play guitar and stuff. That he'd be like, "I forgot, I forgot you. You're so good on guitar." Or something. <laughs> yeah. But, but, uh, but yeah. yeah. In fact, there so was more paint. It was, it was just a. Uh, I, I really love the band and stuff. They, 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 uh, they make music that really expresses things that that I feel inside me. So it was a pleasure. You to want to get it. in on it? Yeah. yeah. Like uh, Omar, mm. had you be a guitar player for him? Yeah, I've played on all their albums except their first DP. I just did another one in August. Does he play on it? I mean, there's one where he didn't play, right? Well, no, he played, but he played like overdubs. Like I played, there's two where I play all, most of the written guitar parts. Yeah. And then he he did additional parts on top of that, but like tracking with the drummer or... Um, I guess it was just one where, I, where for the whole album I played all those parts, but even on the next one I did after that, the last one that was released, I I did uh, I did pretty similar, you know, where I'm where I'm playing uh, a lot of written parts. I think that's really righteous that you would say, yeah, guide me. Oh, it's fun, yeah, because because uh, I spend I've spent so much time, you know, concentrating on practicing guitar, just learning things off records and yeah. things like that. That that uh, to be able to to apply that that skill that I have of being able to learn something and then yeah. and then play it and just have it being just like how hard I'm hitting the guitar, how I'm expressing myself through the part rather than like thinking of the notes and the rhythms. It's just fun. When I was a kid, I thought I would be in Frank Zappa's band when I grew up, you know. <laughs> so so I kind of wanted to have a situation like that where I'm playing some like uh, you know sort of difficult to play music and on time signatures and stuff and just like locking into it and stuff like the it's, challenge of it yeah it's just it's fun and uh yeah and the 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 one we just did i i guess they're probably about to mix it right now that came out that came out really cool they're they're going in a new direction mars volta really exciting mm -hmm. uh we heard uh can't take that away by animal train and some young cats and then uh you guys uh played uh come out by steve reich yeah Thoughts on that? Want to talk about come out? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, come come out. Uh, yeah, it's an experiment, I guess, in 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 phasing that he did with tape recorders in the '60s, where he just takes a loop of. Uh, uh, I think it's an injured kid or something uh, talking. I'm not sure who the kid is, but it's almost like you know. What, what what people would do with sampling now and and with uh, 
a lot of you know with effects and and things like that but he's he's just doing it from what i understand just with tape recorders it's just some of the magic that can yeah yeah that can come and especially it shows all the incredible uh incredibly rich harmonics that are in the human voice and some people have have even more complex ones than others and he pulls all kinds of incredible sounds and rhythms and melodies out of out of this one single phrase of and the yeah. person repeated over and over. I just five words. Yeah, come out to show them, and 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 uh, Captain Beefheart also quoted that in uh, the song. Drum uh, mask. Yeah, on, tra- on the on this last song on the first side. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the song. I remember the drum fill at the beginning, but um, but yeah. So I like I like Steve Rock. Yeah. Who would we play? That lady. Oh, yeah. Came up with the Doctor Who theme song. Mm. She's working in the BBC studios in the 50s and 60s, and they had to cut tape and no synthesizers. Used oscillators. Yeah. And uh, mainly a lot of tape manipulation. Totally, yeah. Speeding up, slowing down. A friend of mine said that's his his Aaron says that's like his favorite song. <laughs> like somebody <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it sounds like. I've read about it. Sounds. <laughs> What's her name? Danbury, her last name. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I don't remember her name. She just died a few years ago, but pretty trip far ahead there's no peers no no status quo they were just pioneers yeah um uh, yeah getting started in music <coughs> your journey where did it start um I guess it was like uh first like hearing some music when I was four years old where I where I realized that um that it was resonating something inside me that I was connected to it was like showing me something about the inside of myself that I didn't know before that so like so there there was that experience which which felt important uh when I was like four and and then uh and then and then uh at gr- growing up being about seven eight years old and hearing music in my head uh, and thinking like, wow, what is this music that's going through my head? Like, it sounds like not from the radio. No music I was head. making yeah. up, but with no effort. It, I was just hearing music that I would want to hear in my head, and yeah. thinking, wow, if I could play an instrument, I could write some cool songs. You know, like but they were just there in my head, like planted in there or something. It didn't feel like something that that I was thinking of or anything. It would just be like being bored walking down the street and entertaining yourself by like hearing music in your head you know and so uh so that made me feel the the fact that that happened so much made me feel like I was um uh, meant to play an instrument and and then uh and I just always had that in my head even from before I knew what a guitar was I knew that I was going to play a guitar so the more I started to hear guitars on records and know what they were know who Jimmy Page was and know who Eddie Van Halen was or whatever the more I started like like uh really wanting to play guitar really badly and uh tried when I was about eight but nobody would buy me an electric and I didn't like the way acoustic sounded so so I so I uh waited until I just had to play I was like killing me to not play so I played acoustic for a while just to prove to my dad that I could play and I I learned uh I was just learning punk songs by ear you know it was off good- records yeah, off records and and just just uh, at first I don't even think I knew how to tune it. I was just playing all the chords with one finger and tuning it to where it sounded like what was on the records to me, you know. And and uh, and then and it was, it was good. My I I you know convinced my dad that I was gonna uh, that I was gonna stick with it and stuff. And so he bought me a Stratocaster. Uh, which was what I wanted by then I was also getting really into Jimi Hendrix and stuff and and then uh, in an amp yeah so he got me a little Roland amp and and a Stratocaster and uh, and and I started uh, you know my it was good because my taste sort of my taste was always going along with my ability like I started out 
learning punk songs and that was what I was really into and it was also a pretty easy thing to learn how to play you know and then then I got into 60s music and then I and then I got into like progressive rock and and I and I was really into Frank Zappa and you know it was just like I I had between the ages of 12 and 16 it was like my taste kept getting more complex and my and my ability was growing with my taste so so uh, I never tried to play things that were way beyond me I always was playing just things that were just a little beyond my ability yeah. and stuff. And what about other people? Did you know people at school playing? playing yeah, I didn't. Them? Not really. Like, like I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't play with a lot of people. I mostly just sat in my bedroom and practiced all the time. I, I was, I was. You know, it would be anywhere between. It was pretty much all I did besides eat and maybe you know, Piss sitting at somebody. Yeah, just sitting at somebody. Maybe go over to somebody's house and watch. You know watch videos or something like that but usually it was just like practice every second that I could sleep in school sometimes like go to school and fall asleep on the couch and <laughs> and wake up when it was time to go home you know <laughs> they let you do that in my school so I, I took advantage I would stay up practicing all night and, and drink tons of coffee and then go to school be a whole war out yeah so so it was a lot of listening to records and playing to them. Yeah, I mean that's that's everything. I feel like everything that I've done has had a lot. Josh is also really big on that. We we both know how to have such a backlog of songs that we know how yeah. to play to get like from off of records that where it's it's a it's a nice kind of shared knowledge because we have it gives you a, a good sort of idea of why things you gradually start to put together why things make you feel what they make you feel you know like when sometimes if I don't know how to play something it's like oh that's a color that I don't know how to express or yeah. something and then you learn how to play it and you develop a sort of vocabulary of knowing which feelings can be produced by which combinations of notes and which rhythms and which uh, uh, you know uh one instrument offsetting another instrument and balancing interaction. It out. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I'm big on learning like as m many of the parts as I can, and I don't just learn guitar things. I've spent a lot of time learning like you know, like John Coltrane song, you know, heads and 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 Ornette Coleman heads and you know Eric Dolphy. I, I go I go through periods of just learning things on other instruments, or I've spent a lot of time learning. Um, things that were made on sequencers, learning parts off electronic music, records of all types, and learning, you know, so starting to see the guitar, not not just uh, as a guitar, but just just picking up the logic of other instruments, because it's a completely yeah. different logic on piano. Piano's a real difficult one to play on guitar, but you try to learn somebody's chord progressions on yeah, piano yeah. and play them on guitar, it teaches you a lot, or learn, like, classical music and try to understand the relationship of all the parts and all that so so yeah for me like that's that's been it seems like the styles that i've developed have been just various ways of com combining uh com combining uh com you know put crossing together and combining feelings of various things that i aspects of things that i like and putting them all together kind of like somebody makes a hip-hop track or something where you just like you take a beat from one thing and a guitar from know. another thing, and you, and you just sort of blend together a lot yeah. of a lot of things, and that's that's kind of how my my music has been. I I I get inspired by learning things off records, and 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 I don't. Uh, it makes me happy to do. I've never, you know, as a kid, I don't know. I think I always had my own voice, but I remember a kid who didn't really seem to care that much about music telling me hey you should be original you're better than this person or that person that you look uh, up to so much and i would be like no i'm not and and you know and and i love learning their stuff like there's no reason i would not do this and gradually i developed uh yeah when did you write your first songs oh right away oh that, right that was away. The, it was actually the first thing i did but but it made me take it more seriously when i started learning other people's songs you know but i emotionally i had to do it right from the beginning so I, that was the day I started playing guitar. I was mad at a kid, and I just I just went into my house and wrote all these songs about like I want to kill him. <laughs> you know, I I I, I must have I filled up like a whole tape and wrote the name of every 
song that I wrote on the cassette tape, and it was just one, I think, I don't have the tape anymore, but it was like, I think it was just one angry song after another, <laughs> and just these punk songs about this kid and about stuff I was mad about, but it made me feel better. I became, I had been going through sort of a rough period where I was sort of imbalanced, um, yeah. and, and, uh, lost and and uh i got that initial aggression out playing music and then i very quickly went into a period of just being a real peaceful person who you know loved the ideals of the 60s and things like that you know and just just wanted to uh just wanted to make music that felt good and went into a very arty period after that of things like you know and talking heads so my first four track recordings were all real kind of arty experimental things uh did like you make a band when you were young? No, this I had conceptual solo. bands in okay. my recordings and stuff. Uh, but like no gigs? No, no. I, I played Crap. a show with my guitar teacher. Uh, that was my first live experience, was playing a bunch of feedback on a cover of a 60s song. They were covering, he had kind of a psychedelic, uh, a modern psychedelic band, and... and uh, and it was kind of a feature for the guitar. I, get, I did all this solo, long solos and feedback and stuff on this one song while he just sang, and and uh, that was that was a lot of fun. But yeah, other than that, I mean, there really wasn't uh, wasn't you know I didn't I didn't really know kids I could see eye to eye with. Yeah, yeah. I, the, there wasn't a lot of kids who wanted to do the same kind of thing, and people seemed to be very concerned with what other people would think yeah, of yeah. what we would do, uh, and they weren't they weren't thinking in terms of like following interests they were thinking in terms of like I want girls to like me at parties and stuff like that and yeah, so pressure. somebody like me who is thinking totally in musical terms of wanting to do something weird or wanting to do something different they didn't or, see any place for that so there was pure yeah pure. yeah I just I, I, I loved the making of music so you know people didn't you know, I, I I felt whenever I would try to play with people, I definitely had experiences, but I felt uh, re- me and them felt totally disconnected from one another. You know, it, they they uh, they thought I was too serious about recording sometimes, or sometimes they thought what I wanted to do was too weird. Or so I pretty much just focused on practicing. I figured when I moved to Hollywood, I would probably find some people who were who were more suited to playing with me and I, I did right away I met a really great bass player when I moved to Hollywood and he was the first person who I really started uh, developing a real musical communication with you know uh, he died a few years later but uh, he really you know he was the first person who I had a real the kind of connection like I have with Josh or that I had with Flea or Omar or whatever like I had that with him first and that was a, that was a great experience. Yeah, maybe it, it was so good. That's how you extended it to these cats after him. Yeah, I mean, you're, it's weird the way the universe pushes people together. You know, I feel like when you're ready and you you meet the people who you're meant to play with, it's like, it sometimes happens like magic. You might never go out during a certain period of time, and you go out one time and you meet somebody who becomes like a lifelong you know, yeah. musical partner it's it's uh i can't help but feel like there's a plan sometimes because it's it's weird how i didn't meet anybody who i had that kind of connection with as a kid and then in my adult life i've slowly you know i've i probably know like five people like that who i feel like i have a really yeah. you know born connection with but, but that's um, pretty bold moving out to out here when you hadn't felt it yet um, well, I, I knew I wanted to, I wanted to be a musician and I felt like Hollywood was the place to... Where were you at before? Chatsworth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not too far. No, nah, I was <laughs> it, it, It's very far in some ways. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Light years. <laughs> yeah, it's the deep valley and it's just nothing going on there and people... You know, it, it it was good. It kept me in my bedroom thermos practicing. Bottle. It you was know, a thermos bottle. It, yeah, because people, people were very... Uh, well, when it comes to working on yourself, maybe you need yeah not distraction. Yeah, I'm not sure what would happen if I would have grown up in Mar Vista where I lived before that. Like I, um, I in Mar Vista, it seemed like there was you know I knew some cool older kids and right. you know like like uh, had a friend who was into punk and stuff and like 
<coughs> I moved to Chatsworth, and the fact that I was punk was just yeah. like solitary un- confinement. Unheard of, <laughs> you know. People thought I was so weird and had the nickname Punker John, and didn't like that. <laughs> and, and just like you know, it just made me feel like a real outcast and I think more and more I just kind of I went through a weird phase of just trying to be kind of normal for a while and fit in and then I and then I gave up on that and just focused on making music in my bedroom over you know all the time and let myself be as weird as I actually am you know yeah yeah interesting so it's hard to really plan the life journey yeah I think it's more important just to follow your heart mm-hmm. I think when when somebody's goal is to to sort of uh, to succeed at something in some way or to or to uh, when they're thinking of it in terms of I want to be seen by the outside world yeah. like this or that like like uh, I, I feel like it's sending all kinds of weird mixed messages to your inner self. I think you'll get what you want out of life as long as you're clear about what it is that you want. You know, if that's all you want, yeah, there's plenty of steps you can take to do that. But if you really love music, I think just following your heart and playing the music that you're interested in and and uh, and and just putting every you know bit of energy into every day towards that one that one idea of wanting to. Uh, wanting to merge with that force that music comes from uh, the universe has really skillful exacting ways of 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 uh, putting you in the place that you need to be at the right time to play with the people who you're meant to play with you know and, and uh, I think it only you know it only comes from some kind of inner inner confusion about the reasons that you're doing it when when you when uh, when you don't get what you want, I think it just comes from some. You know, I I feel like the 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 my, for me my 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 mindset was always just like I want to make music that you know that I uh, that I feel good about making. I I just want to you know, and I for me it, it it wouldn't have made a difference in my mind whether I was in a you know in a club band or if I was a rock star or something like it. That that was a total non-issue to me. Like I wanted to make, you know, music that I liked and that I felt good about, and and that was something I was always doing anyway. So it just seemed like, yeah. I kn- and when you know, so I just always felt like, you know, if it's good music, there's always going to be some people who want to hear it. You know, and just, the other stuff just wasn't important to me. You know, yeah. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, sometimes some people are in a sort of a state of confusion where you're 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 motivated by sort of a, you know and 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 to some degree you know i can't say that like you know i i've i've gotten sucked into it too where you're kind of you lose a little of your focus on what you're hearing on your inside and you're you're concerned about what these people think or what those people think and and uh, outside and i feel like that's that's the enemy there you know you you've really got to listen to what's because I feel like music comes through inner channels inside yourself. Mm-hmm. When, just like I was saying when I was a kid, I would just hear it in my yeah, head. It right. wasn't like I was trying to think of a song. And that's how songwriting is. It's you just have to listen to what's going on in your head. You don't try to write a song. And I think that's why a lot of the time people who write really good pop songs, a lot of the time the good song is the only good song on the whole album because because they're not really listening. They're just trying to achieve something and. And I think it's fine if that's if that's the goal if that's if that's what you're trying to do. But it, but I've always tried hard to listen to what's inside me and to follow my ever changing interests that are on the inside and 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 uh, and to conform to some degree to the situation. Like in, I'm in like being in a band like I was in was really about like okay how can I how can I how can I bend this or twist this or push this in this yeah. direction or that but it's still ascribing to the previous energy of the you know what the red hot chili peppers is and then see in which directions can we move this and bend it and stuff and 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 that's all you know that's another way of listening to what's on the inside of you to conform it to a specific musical situation but um my favorite thing is just to really listen to what's inside myself without 
any consideration of who's going to hear it or, or where it's going or, yeah. or, or what place it has in the world or whether people would think it's good or not. Like, more and more, I just don't think that that stuff matters, you know. My, my favorite times in my life have been where I've just been making music for no other reason than just to do it. And, and, uh, and I think it's important to always stay in touch with that part of yourself, even if you are in a band with people and, and some of the people are, you know, wanting to uh, have their mind on other things other than just the making the music to, to make sure that you, at least for yourself, stay connected to the musical source by, by, uh, by having a good amount of activity that you're doing that's 100% just because you like doing it, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wise words. Thank you, John. <laughs> yeah. For real. Much respect. Let's play some tunes. Watch for Pedro Show. Uh, we heard uh, Marlena Dietrich with uh, Lil Marlena. And then we heard uh, Enough of Me from uh, John Frusciati's uh, solo record, Imperion, along with Josh. And I thank you both for coming down to Pedro. Yeah, thanks for having and, me. Uh, Great to have you here. Gracing us with the wise words and the righteous <laughs> jams and your spirits. Definitely. Uh, it's January 25th, 2009 edition of Watt from Peter Show. Brother Matt, thank you very much for Pleasure. essential aid and abetting. Everybody, keep your powder dry. Yeah. <laughs>